Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome back as we dig dive, dig, dive, and just explore deeper the Master Craftsman Philosophy Program as we go through and work our way uh, into more and more of Albert Pike's Morals and Dogma. We're almost out of this, guys, uh, as we push through. We're about to start Section 10, uh, the 31st and 32nd degrees in those chapters. So join with me, crack open those books. Uh, and, and we're going to get moving uh, as we explore uh, the 31st degree and take a look at that. Remember, if you're in the Valley of St. Louis Master Craftsman Study Group, it is imperative uh, that you read the material before uh, listening to this lecture. Again, it's only highlights, so uh, great resource. It's a good finalization, um, but it's very important you read the material beforehand. So let's get started, brethren. We're excited to do it. Let's get going. Okay, here we go, brethren, as we dive into the 31st degree Inspector Inquisitor uh, or Grand Inspector Inquisitor uh, Commander, as is titled in Morals and Dogma. This starts on page 939 in your text. Uh, really an intriguing degree. Uh, it's important we note the differentiation within the right that has disappeared uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, it existed somewhat in the time of Pike um himself uh but definitely was obliterated thereafter not so much by leadership but by grassroots growth and explosion um of interest in the right but very much the 30th degree the council of kadosh that pinnacle point those are foot soldiers uh within the right to carry the banner to rebuild the order if you will the 31st and 32nd degree kind of are different um there the 31st degree is a tribunal body to judge, sit in judgment. And the 32nd, if you listen to the ritual, they talk about being sages and magus uh, and adepts. These are teachers. That's a teaching degree. Uh, that's the great instructor point um, for which they deliberate. So uh, this is, again, the tribunal degree. Um, the traditional, al or I shouldn't say the traditional allegory. The current allegory opens on two nights um, at some distant place, perhaps Egypt by insinuation. Uh, and they're arguing about these hieroglyphics they see on a wall. The younger knight says they should be destroyed. Uh, the older knight says they should be saved for their, their symbolism and their lessons. Um, and, and following their discussion, we're transported back and we bear witness to the Egyptian court of the dead, the process of judgment um, in, in regards to the allegorical final judgment as said through the Egyptian faith, the candidate is said to re represent Curies, uh, who is an architect. Um, and this degree is kind of interesting in that uh, the Egyptian court of the dead scene, that has been part of this degree uh, from the 1880s and, and all that work. But we're missing the second half of this degree. The second half of this degree, uh, after you learn about judgment, is, is learning about uh, the concept of judgment and law. Uh, and it involves you meeting with these sages. Um, the current ritual, the revised Pike ritual, took that whole apartment out um, and has moved it almost word for word to the 20th degree. So now if you go through the 20th degree, you'll meet some sages, uh, Alfred the Great and Confucius and, and a whole bunch of other folks. And, and that actually was part of this degree. So let's dive in. Um, we're told right off the bat with this degree that we should hear patiently, weigh deliberately and dispassionately, and decide impartially. These are the our chief duties as a judge. Um, and it's not that we should judge other men. Rather, we should judge ourselves, our soul, our own actions, um, and inspect ourselves and scrutinize our own words, our own deeds. This degree is about a lot of interplay between divine and mortal law um, and a very important concept there played out. So we're impressed this concept of weighing deliberately, hearing passionately and dis, uh, excuse me, hearing patiently and acting dispassionately and being impartial. Those are key big things for us. And we're told that the Holy Bible will remind us of our obligation that as judges here below, 
so you will be judged yourself hereafter by one whom doesn't have to submit like an earthly judge to the sad necessity of interfering the motives or inferring the motives, the intentions, the purposes um, from the uncertain and often unsafe testimony of others. He sees it all. He knows all. He understands it and he permeates it. The peculiar and probably principal symbol of this degree in many ways, of course, is going to be the Tractatus of Pythagoras, which we've seen various other degrees and various other ways. Um, and it's shown to us in different forms in this degree at different points. The three supports of a temple itself, of course, are also unique and important emblems. Um, they represent, of course, wisdom or the divine infinite intelligence, strength, or the power and infinite divine will and beauty, or the infinite divine harmony. The eternal law by virtue of which the infinite myriads of suns and worlds flash ever onward in their careless revolutions without clash or conflict in the infinite of space and change the movement of all the laws of created existence. Now, we understand um, this great symbol and, and how... These points all come interplayed, but Pike here talks about them rolled into the symbolism of the Tetractus um, and how it was represented. You know, we and we talk about how these things interlock and symbols within symbols. Uh, the lecture itself points out, of course, that the triple triangle is peculiarly sacred, having been among the nations a symbol of the deity. For Pythagoras, as is noted uh, in the work. We represent it with 10 dots in a, in a triangle formation, as you'll see in your text on page 940. The duties of this degree, of course, are broad and, and fairly important. Oh, excuse me. Fairly important to our task. We must remember also that we have other duties to perform than those of a judge. We're to inquire, and, and this is going to the greater scope of your duties as in, uh, Inspector Inquisitor. You're to inquire and scrutinize the work of subordinate bodies in masonry. You are to see that the recipients of higher degrees are not unnecessarily multiplied, and proper persons are excluded from membership, and that in the life and conversation of masons, they practice excellence in our doctrines and our values. You're to inquire into your own heart and conduct. Watch over yourself. Do not go astray. If you harbor ill will or jealousy, if you are hospitable to intolerance and bigotry, if you're churlish to great gentleness and kind affections, opening wide your heart to one and closing its portals to other others, it's time for you to set in order your own temple, or lest you wear in vain the name and insignia of a mason, while yet uninvested with Masonic nature. Knowing that, knowing that the laws of matter we learn only by observation and experience and realizing all these things leads us to this idea of the law of justice to find out the universal law of justice uh, is one thing. And that's what we find to undertake to measure off something with our own little tape line and call that God's law of justice is another. So our interpretive of universal, uh, our interpretation of the universal law of justice in our minds is one idea of it. But to use that as a measure to say that's God's law of justice, quite different. The great general plan and system, the great general laws enacted by God continually produce, which to our limited notions is wrong and injustice, which hitherto men have been able to explain to their own satisfaction only by hypothesis of another existence in which all inequalities and injustices in this life will be remedied and compensated for. It is very easy to lay down a broad principle embodying our own ideas about what absolute justice is and to insist that everything shall conform to it, to say all affairs must be subject to this law paramount. What is right and therewith is correct stands. What is wrong conflicts and fails. Private cohesions of self-love, friendship, patriotism, they must all be subordinate to that universal gravitation toward that eternal right. This difficulty is the universe of necessities God created in a sequence of cause and effects. Impractical rules in morals are always injurious, for all men fall short 
of compliance with them. They turn real virtues into imaginary offenses against a forged law. God has made the great system of the universe and enacted great laws for its government. Those laws environ everything that lives with a mighty network of necessity. He chooses to create the tiger with such organs that he cannot crop the grass. He must eat other flesh to starve. He has made man carnivorous also, and some of the smallest birds are so much so as the tiger. And every step we take and every breath we draw is involved the destruction of a multitude of animate existences, each, no matter how minute, as much as a living creature of ourselves. He has made necessary among mankind a division of labor, intellectual and moral. He has made necessary the varied relations of our society, dependence of obedience and control. A sense of justice belongs to human nature and to a part of it. Men find a deep and permanent instinctive delight in that justice, not only from its outward effects, but its inward causes, and by their nature love the law of right. Justice keeps just relations between men. It holds the balance between nation and nation, between man and his family, tribe, nation, race, so that his absolute rights and theirs do not interfere, nor their ultimate interest ever clash, nor the internal interest of one prove agnostic to those of all or another one. This we must believe, if he believes that God is just, we must do justice to all and demand it for all. That is a universal human debt, a universal human claim, but we may err greatly in defining what justice is. We intuitively understand what justice is better than we can depict it. What is a giving cause depends so much on the circumstance, the definitions of which are wholly deceitful. Often it would be unjust to society to do what would, in the absence of consideration, be pronounced just to the individual. Realizing these things, realizing these concepts, we come to deeper understanding of the work and with this degree, we come to understanding the relationship of justice in the divine sense and in our own sense. Pike provides us some great examples of harmony in nature. Think about how you can contrast and reconcile those. And when he talks about these, he comes to some interesting conclusions on the back half um, that are necessary. So can they be unjust or are they just? God is a great lawgiver. Of course, when we talk about fairness and equality uh, and conduct, our minds are drawn to the fellow craft degree. And Pike talks a little bit about those. We didn't heart so much to those, uh, but he does talk about those very early on. How do you feel about that? How do you consider those concepts in your own existence, in your own play with justice? My brothers, thank you again for joining us here for the Valley of St. Louis Master Craftsman Program as we dive into the philosophy course, as we dig deeper into Morals and Dogma. We're almost done. One more chapter left. Thank you for being a part of this. We'll catch you next time. Have a good evening, good morning, good afternoon, whatever it may be.